everybody take out your swords out of your backpack or somewhere. I want you to be able to see your Bibles. Reach into your backpack and go like this. Or your iPhone. Pull out your iPhone and go. Don't throw it. Take out your swords and open your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter 4. Can I have all the lights up? All of them? I know it may diminish the intimacy, but the corporate dimension may increase and the Bible dimension. Here we go. Um, can everybody see their Bibles? Yeah. All right. Acts chapter 4 is where we are. I, I want you to feel naked without your Bible. I, have you ever had a dream where you're in public and suddenly realize you're naked? Have you? Be honest. I, I have had those. I would like you to feel that way without your Bible. I want to see people walking out of Stuart and going, oh, my Bible, and run back into Stuart. That, that's what I want to, want to see. So here we are. Acts chapter 4. We are the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. Acts chapter 4 is an incredible story of apostolic passion, of living for Christ and proclaiming Christ and making him known in the world that is, makes you willing to give your life for this. And you do know that this world is filled with competing passions. There are a myriad of passions competing for your hearts, for your minds, for your lives. Listen to one missionary speaking to this issue. Floyd McClung says, what are you passionate about? What will you live for? What will you die for? We live in a world of competing passions. If we do not die to self and fill our lives with the consuming passion of the worship of God in the nations, we will end up with other passions. It's possible to deceive ourselves into thinking we have biblical passions when in reality all we have done is to baptize the values of our culture and give them Christian names. I don't know if that strikes you, but it really strikes my heart. In what ways am I baptizing the values of Eric Tanis or my, my American culture and just giving them Christian names? In what ways is the church doing this? And he says this, we will have chosen apostolic passion only when our hearts are filled with God's desire for his son to be worshipped in the nations. What are your driving passions in life? What do you get really excited about, really thrilled about? What do you wake up in the morning wanting to live for more than anything else? If it's not the glory of Christ worshiped in the nations, not just in your life, but in the nations, it's not apostolic passion, it's not biblical passion, it's not passion grounded in the glory of God. And so I want to look at this passage this morning of Peter and John, these two apostles, and the boldness of their apostolic passion. They had just healed a man in the temple courts, and he makes quite a nuisance of himself. He had been crippled for 40 years. He hadn't been able to walk for 40 years, and he, he was a common sight in the temple, and he was healed, and he runs through the temple, praising God and leaping with joy for his healing. And the religious leaders hate this. They try to stop this because power and influence are moving away from them and toward the apostles. And so they try to put an end to it. And they say this. So let's pick it up in chapter 4, verse 1. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Do you see their main problem they have? Their main problem is with the name of Jesus and what he accomplishes with his resurrection. That resurrection changed everything for these apostles. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word, believed, and listen to this, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. We've already got 3,000 coming to Christ in Pentecost. Don't forget, in the same city that had just previously been yelling a few days before, crucify him, now they're bowing the knee to Jesus. In the thousands, the Spirit's on the move. Verse five, on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. 
And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Do you see the primary purpose of the healing? Do you see the primary motive of the preaching? To point to Jesus. Behold the Son indeed. Behold the Son indeed. That's exactly what they're saying. Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. Yes, look at the healing, but only as a means to look at Jesus. To think about the name, and that is their big problem. Think about Jesus. It's that name that's done this. He's the one who healed him. Let it be known to all of you and to the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. Listen to this boldness, clarity, conviction, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, no worldly credentials for this boldness, they were astonished. And listen to this. And they recognized they had been with Jesus. How'd you like to have that said about you? Really, what could possibly be better than that? Now, it, it may get them killed, and it will. The, the apostles all but John died martyrs' deaths, and he lived a martyr's life. But what would you rather have said about you? You could just tell she had been with Jesus. What do you want to be known for? How about, obviously, having been with Jesus? But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed. Through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. Do you see their big problem is the name? They're saying, all right, the healing is one thing, but this name is the problem. And that will always be the case for us. People will actually applaud you when you feed the hungry, when you help the sick. That's admirable, regardless of the religion or the culture. But preaching Jesus, who's going to do that? That's what will always incur the persecution, the resistance, the rejection. So let us never shirk from the thing that only we will do in what will always eventually bring persecution, the name of Jesus being proclaimed as the only way. They call them and charge them, to not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. Do you see how black and white it is to them? If we don't preach Christ, we're listening not to God, but to you. It's either or in their minds. You must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom the sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. What an amazing picture we have of boldness, of apostolic passion that should be the passion we share. And, and the first thing I want to point out is really uh, dovetailing with what Dr. Lundy preached on last time, on Friday, this idea that Jesus 
transforms us. When we are made into new creatures in Christ, we're different. When you have beheld the Son, when you have beheld the glory of God in the face of Christ, you're never the same. It's not just a mere assent to an intellectual fact, but it's a powerful truth that the Holy Spirit brings home to you, and the resurrection power that brought Jesus from the dead now brings you to life again. That's the message of the gospel, that we're new creatures in Christ. This message has changed us forever. And they became like the one they adored. They spent time with him. They, they were changed by Jesus. And this shouldn't surprise us or them. Jesus is the one who said to them in Luke 6, 20, a disciple is not above his teacher. Everyone who has been trained or taught will be like his teacher. And so we have the character that reflects Christ. Jesus has dropped off on them. He had left an indelible imprint in their souls and their characters. And their lives were now defined by him and his cause. And their passion was Christ. Now I think you might be sitting there, some of you saying, well, they were apostles. They got to see Jesus after he'd risen from the dead. How dare you, Thomas, suggest that I could have the same sort of boldness and passion and conviction and sort of consistency in life that the apostles have. That's a little unreasonable, isn't it? I don't think so at all. You know, there were a lot of other people who were eyewitnesses of the resurrection, and it made no difference in their lives. Obviously, uh, a physical awareness of the resurrected Christ is not enough. And I want to suggest to you that actually we're in an advantageous position over these apostles to really know Christ. And how could that possibly be? Well, I take it on Jesus' authority. Do you know Jesus said this in John 16, 7? He says... Uh, nevertheless, I tell you, truly, it is to your advantage that I go away. To our advantage? No, how could that possibly be? We need Jesus with us. They had an unfair advantage, didn't they? No, Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the comforter won't come. But if I go, I'll send him to you. Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit and the way he indwells us in this new covenant reality post the day of Pentecost is an advantageous position to be in, to be his disciples and to be his ambassadors. We're not at a disadvantage. And as a matter of fact, we have advantages over them. Like what? Like them. We have them to look back to in this story to read this morning. They didn't have it. They were living it. All they had were the, the Old Testament scriptures. We have the lives of the apostles now. And the writings they were commissioned by Jesus to write, they didn't even have the New Testament. They didn't have 2,000 years of church history to fuel their passion for Christ. And yet they had it. Don't say you're at a disadvantage. Don't fall into what Charles Spurgeon called historic heroism. Though it wasn't it great how God used to work in the past. No, and do you know we have the same essential ingredients, realities, to be uh, bold for Jesus like this and to have him make a difference in our lives? And what is it? Do you know what it is? What are the two essential ingredients to be true disciples? Do you know? The same Spirit of God and the same Word of God that the Spirit inspires and illumines our minds to understand is at work in us. Let us never turn the Bible into a history book to see how God used to work. God wants to work in our lives in this way. He has made a difference in our lives too. And did you notice the main way they saw they were like Jesus in their boldness? There were lots of ways, no doubt, they were like Jesus. But the one highlighted in this passage is their boldness that doesn't come from what? Worldly credentials, resumes, degrees, accomplishments that are impressive in a worldly success syndrome. No, they had a boldness that came from the Spirit of God, that came from knowing the resurrected Christ like we do. And they proclaimed Christ even if it cost them their lives. And throughout the book of Acts, if there's any one thing that's obviously true, and throughout the whole New Testament after the resurrection, is that these followers of Jesus had a boldness because Jesus was alive. That's what we've affirmed this morning in our time of worship. Jesus is alive. He's there for the Lord. He therefore really won. He really accomplished everything he said he set out to accomplish. He really is the Lord. And this boldness didn't have any gray areas when it came to the gospel. And becoming like Jesus is the result of being with him and others like him in a relationship fed by Jesus through the scriptures and the Holy Spirit. 
And Christ-like character and holy boldness flows from this. But proclamation evangelism that's articulated clearly and confidently with conviction is really falling on hard times. I, w- I believe we are in a crisis of bold proclamation evangelism. I, I don't think Christians, I, from all the research I see and have done myself, most Christians barely ever proclaim Christ to anyone. And there are several obstacles that I think are preventing us in our minds and hearts from being these sorts of bold witnesses. One of them is that hell doesn't really exist. And T. Wright says that he thinks the greatest unspoken assumption of the evangelical church is that there really isn't a hell. If people are really going to hell, we would be more bold with a greater sense of urgency. The second is Jesus isn't really the only way. It couldn't be more clear in this passage that he is the only way. There's no other name. There's no one else we find salvation. But the personal nature of God and the jealousy of God in this covenant relationship demands an exclusivity in our relationship with him. He really is the only way. One of the other obstacles that I think keeps getting in our way to to proclaim Christ the way we're called is uh, this idea that, you know, my life is my witness. You know, you don't need to use words. We, we quote St. Francis of Assisi all the time. I don't think he even actually said this quotation. Uh, Preach the gospel at all times and only use words when necessary. Ooh. Now, maybe that, if St. Francis did say it, maybe it's because he spent a lot of time with animals who couldn't talk anyway. But you do know, I don't think he said it historically, but you do know the gospel always have, has proclamation, articulated gospel. Listen to Romans chapter 10. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how are they to call on him in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him in whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. We are called to proclaim with conviction that Jesus is alive and he alone saves but we always want to opt on being a nice guy. I remember one time I, I stopped to help this young lady. She was about 16, change a tire. And, and she had a friend, Gina, was standing with her. Her name was Melissa. And I walk up to her beat-up old El Torino. It was just this beat-up old car. And there's a baby sitting in the car on a cold winter day. And, and I'm, it's in Wisconsin, not here. We don't have cold winter days here. And I'm, I'm helping her change her tire And I'm talking to her about the Packers and the weather, and the Spirit is saying, Eric, take this deeper. And I said, Lord, I just want to be a nice guy. Can't I just be a nice guy? And it's as if the Spirit was saying, no, Eric, she doesn't need a nice guy. She needs Jesus. And so I swallowed hard. I didn't want to, but I said, hey, Melissa, tell me. Uh, Her son's name in the car, the baby, uh, his name is Skylar. I said, is Skylar's dad around? And she said, no. And I said, Men. She said, yeah. <laughs> and I wanted to go back to the Packers. And the Lord wouldn't let me, and I said, hey, Melissa, I'm really glad you kept him. And she said, oh, me too. She said, my dad was going to kill me, but now he's a happy grandpa. And I said, hey, Melissa, it's not going to be long before Skylar grows up and is a little bit older and... Uh, he asks you questions about heaven and hell and life and death and God. What are you going to tell him? And she said, oh, you know, I went to a religious school growing up, and I just have a lot of problems with the Christian faith. And I said, like what? And she said, well, I believe God created everything, but uh, like the virgin birth, for instance. I said, Melissa, you just said God created everything from nothing. You don't think he could pull off the virgin birth? And she said, oh, yeah, I never thought of it that way. And, <laughs> and, and I said, hey, Melissa, you know what? When I was little, my dad left when I was little, and my mom had a mental breakdown, and I was raised in pretty rough circumstances, and I was the stinky kid in my grammar school. You know, every school has a couple stinky kids in it, and I was, that was me and my brother, and, and I said, and I don't know what would have happened to me if my mother, in the midst of her issues, didn't sit me on her lap and read the Bible to me and teach me about Jesus, and I realized I desperately needed a Savior, and Jesus was that Savior, and it made all the difference in my life. You know what she said to me? You sound like my mom's friend. She talks like this all the time. Have you ever ever had a sense that you're actually, in a moment, part of the answer to prayers someone's praying? That's what happened in that moment, and I said, oh, Melissa, 
Skylar's going to have questions. You need to answer them. And, and we had a wonderful time. And she said, you were the stinky kid? And I said, yeah. And she said, so was I. It was an amazing divine appointment on the side of the road. And she, when I was done, she said, can I give you a hug? And she said, I'm going to start reading the Bible to Skylar. And, and, and it was amazing. It was a time where she was, was meeting Jesus on the side of a road. She didn't need a nice guy. I, I find people all the time, we assume they don't want to know Jesus. And that's another one we get caught up. And they don't want to hear about it. They don't want to hear about Jesus. They're not interested I don't believe that's true. I think most people want to hear answers to life's biggest questions. I think people are literally dying for answers to hope in life. And we've got them, the words of eternal life. I remember I sat on a plane and I said, Lord, it's been months since I, I told anybody about Jesus. Would you please give me an opportunity today and make it easy? I said, I don't want to work. I'm tired. Would you make it easy? I sit down on a plane. A, a good-looking businessman comes by. He sits down next to me. He's got a Starbucks cup, and we say hi. It says Raul on his Starbucks cup. And I say, hey, Raul, how you doing? And he goes, hey, ho, oh, how are you? He told me later he thought it was a client whose name he had forgotten, and he thought he was going to lose an account. And, and, <laughs> and so I worked that for about two minutes, right, because I sort of thought that was going on. And so we're talking, and I said, Raul, I don't really know you. I just saw your name on the cup. He's like, oh, man. And, I was really upset, and, and, and I said, maybe, maybe Raul's the one the Lord wants me to talk to about Jesus today, and, and uh, he said, hey, what do you do? I said, what do you do? He said, I sell steel, and I said, he said, what do you do? I said, I'm a pastor, and I teach the Bible, and he goes, man, do I have some questions for you, <laughs> and and he said, you know, I grew up in a Catholic church, never read the Bible in my life. This year, I decided I'm going to read the Bible. I'm reading the Bible. God's telling people to make all these sacrifices in the Old Testament. I get to the New Testament, and God's the one making the sacrifice. I don't get it. Is it two different gods? I said, we can, we can get somewhere with this, Raul. This is good. And, and so, uh, guys, it couldn't have been easier. It was amazing. People want the news. Don't believe the lie that everybody's going to reject you and say no to you. And, and even that's part of the deal anyway. Don't buy that. Don't believe that Jesus is the only way. And this idea that we don't have the authority, right? Who dare you? Who do you think you are telling me I should do something, change my mind? Look, we can't be timid about this. I'm amazed at those, look, do we have the authority? Yes, we do. Who's, it, the, one, who's the one who said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me? Go, therefore, he says, and make disciples of all nations. We've got the ultimate authority. But we go, not in our own authority, but his, and we go confidently, assuming people really want to hear the good news of great joy that we have. Here's where Mulehoff's tone comes in. We can go to people and say, i got to tell you about Jesus because I'm supposed to because I'm a Christian. I know you really don't want to, but it's like a big shot we give people. Here, you don't dare take that. I, I know you didn't want that, but you need it. No, that's not how we communicate the gospel, right? It's good news of great joy. And we need to see it that way, and that needs to come through in the way we talk to people about Jesus. You don't have the authority. To write. I'm amazed at how many people think they have authority. I played football and I worked construction for years. I have hung out with some surly characters. And I would go away on the road working as a commercial diver for a while through college. And I, I hung out with these guys. And they would go to strip clubs. And they were evangelistic about strip clubs. They'd say, what's wrong with you, kid? You're not going to the strip club? What's your problem? Don't you know how great this is? What do you mean you're not going to go get drunk with us? What's your problem? Don't you know how good this is? What do you mean you're going for a two-hour walk when we put on the in-room pornographic movie? What's your deal? They were enthusiastically evangelistic about immorality and were timid about Jesus. Explain this to me. I have people in my own family when they heard we were adopting. This person said, oh, when was Caroline born? And I said, March. She said, great. She's Aries. You're Aries. It'll work out great. She knows I'm a Christian. She didn't feel like she needed to clean up her language and not bring her horoscope beliefs. And people are always saying to me, is that karma or what? <laughs> no, actually, no, I don't think it is. I don't believe in karma. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you about Jesus, though. They, they have no problem. Right, talking about karma and horoscopes and, 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 and juice plus or whatever it is, every, you know, anything, Amway, it, it, all these things to be enthusiastic about. What about Jesus? Can we be enthusiastic about Jesus? Yes, I, I should hope so. 
People do want to hear the gospel. I can tell you over and over again stories of people who want to hear the gospel. I'm making myself sound like Joe Evangelist, aren't I? Let me just kill that idea right now. Same time in two weeks, I saw I was believing some lies. I walk into a diner, I'm, I'm in a salad bar, and this lady looks over and says, oh, look at that salad, you're too healthy. And I said, look at you, you got a whole pile of greens on your plate. And she said, oh, I got my cholesterol tested. Now I'm trying to be righteous and holy and pure. <laughs> and went through my mind to say, ma'am, you're going to need more than greens for that. <laughs> you're going to need Jesus. You know what I said instead? <laughs> That's it, that's all I said. <laughs> Same week, I go into a diner with a friend and the hostess looks at me and she says, did you do something wrong? And I said, no, why? And she said, because people don't smile like that at 6 a.m. unless they did something wrong. <laughs> and it went through my mind to say, ma'am, I'm a Christian. And this 6 a.m. smile is the smile of a man who's been forgiven because of Jesus. That's what went, went through my mind. You know what I said? <laughs> 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 and she sits us down, the whole waitress comes over, she's watched this one, he smiles a lot. On the way out, she says, you're still smiling. And it went through my mind to say, that's because I'm forgiven because of Jesus. And you know what I said? <laughs> nothing. I said, nothing. Just a while back, I came from a funeral of a man named Orton Horn. I walk into the Starbucks on Imperial, and I walk in, and the lady goes, the, the kid goes, he's a boy, he says, a teenager, he says, Boy, you're dressed up for a Saturday. And I said, yeah, I just came from a funeral of a good man. And he said to me, well, that's what life's all about, isn't it? Just being good. And I wanted to say, no, Orton lived a good life because he lived his life for Jesus. And you know what I said, huh? Yup. I don't know what lies I was believing, but, but the times that the Spirit has emboldened me because of what Jesus has done in me, it's been so different. So let's not believe these lies. And I want you to notice what they say. Do you notice what they say? It's this amazing word to us today. They say, we cannot but speak of what we've seen and heard. Verse 19. Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you uh, rather than to God, you must be the judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. We can't. We can't do any other thing. Hey, I want you to imagine what it would have been like for Peter to hear the words, okay, do your healing stuff, do your, your helping people thing, but this Jesus thing has to go. Imagine how that sounded to Peter. He says, oh, basically, uh, that's not an option, sir. You need to realize what I've seen. You need to realize what I've experienced, and then hopefully you'll see I don't have the option to not speak of him. Because I heard his teachings for three years and he amazed us because he taught with a power and authority unlike we had ever seen before. He took the scriptures we had grown up with and he helped us to see what they were all about. He taught with power and clarity and he helped us understand what the kingdom of God really was. It was always all about him, the king. And we saw his miracles. We saw him give blind people sight, crippled people ability to walk, Deaf people, the ability to hear, and dead people, the ability to walk out of their tomb. See, we need to talk about this. We don't have any other option. And we saw his character every day, backing all this up, his holiness and his righteousness and his compassion and his love and his grace and his truthfulness. We've got to talk about Jesus. We don't have an option, sir. And most of all, we saw him break bread and give us wine to drink, and washed our feet. And then we saw him go to a cross and die on that cross for our sins and the sins of the whole world. When we had done nothing to deserve it or earn it, you see, we must talk about that. And that's not the end of the story because on Easter Sunday morning, he burst out of that tomb never to die again because we saw him ascend into the heavens and he told us he's coming back. So in the meantime, we're going to talk about him. 
We don't have any other option but to talk about him. And then we've seen the amazing transforming work he's done in our lives where we've gone from cowards to be willing to be people who stand before you now and say, kill me if you must. But we're going to talk about Jesus. Because he's done this transforming work in their lives and in countless lives ever since. In your life, in the lives of the people sitting around you, Jesus is alive. He has done this. You know, at the end of John Newton's life, this former ship captain of a slave ship who who was a blasphemer, he called himself, and a wicked man. And when he came to an understanding of what Jesus had done for him, that he was forgiven not because of anything he had done, but only because of what Jesus had done, it changed his life forever. The man who wrote Amazing Grace, you know, near the end of his life, his memory was gone and he was delirious and he was going through brutal times and and a friend, John Jay, came to see him and he remembers Newton saying to him, my memory is almost entirely gone, but I still remember two things, that I am a great sinner and that Jesus is a great savior. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.